I am joining you from an undisclosed location um, <laughs> in which I had to do a, a little um, a work trip. Matthew's in a submarine so, somewhere. I know, like you can see the fish on the wall and stuff. And so I, I, I managed to throw <laughs> into my, um, uh, I threw into my bag before I left for, for the hotel that I'm at right now, um, a bottle of Larceny, which was the only whiskey I had in the house. And so I'm drinking it out of a plastic cup right now. Um, so that's, that's my evening right here, but. Mm. You know what? I've definitely been there. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's, yeah. I'm not embarrassed by this. I just no. want to be clear about that. So. <laughs> oh, it's not embarrassment. It's just like, you know, sometimes you'd like to have an actual glass for your whiskey. Yeah. 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 <laughs> First of all, it is nice. Like, I feel like it's eating through those plastic cups because they're so thin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, There's a, I'm a little solid bit, chance I'll spill it on myself too. So that's, that's yeah. cool. Yay. I'm a little bit of an obsessive. So like I just, I bought this for like really cheap at like some Japanese store, but then I bought like actual old fashioned glasses and I only have one of each because I live alone. And also the ones that came in sets of two, I've broken multiple of them. So I have this glass, I have a really cool Glen Cairn glass and then like an official Glen Cairn glass. And then I have another yeah. old fashioned glass. So I have five whiskeys to drink, five different glasses. Love it. I, I sympathize with that, Varsha. Like there's certain um, of our cocktail classes, like we have some really lovely Nick and Nora glasses, which I'm not allowed to wash because I break them if I if I do sometimes. So, because yeah. I have big, I'm like, I'm really tall. Like you can't tell on Zoom, but like I'm a big gangly guy and like the fingers don't work so well sometimes. So. It's actually a minnow behind Matthew. That's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> So, actually that's that's like a 20 foot shark it's just all forced perspective is what it is yeah. anyway um so i think we should get going if that's that's okay with everybody um thank you everyone for for joining us uh for this new episode of drinking with historians we are exceptionally delighted to welcome back to the show tracy franklin um who is uh, a part of the nearest and jack um uh, distilling initiative um but we're also really excited to welcome uh, mallory o'mara who is the author i'm uh, sorry the, the host of a podcast um called reading glasses but also a forthcoming book called um girly drinks a history of women and spirits it actually exists there it is right there you can buy it out, out in october october 19th i'm buying it i'm just gonna as soon as it's over i'm pre-ordering it thank it's you happening. so yeah it's it is all it's the history of women and women drinking making and serving alcohol from the dawn of time until today it Amazing, sounds, right? it sounds <laughs> absolutely wonderful so and You're i should say too <laughs> yeah. um, we're going to try to have kind of a more free-flowing conversation today, so please, if you have questions, uh, put them in the Q&A. Um, Rachel will disappear behind the scenes in just a few minutes, and then she'll, she'll pay attention to them and feed them to us, and we'll, we'll get to them. Uh, but we're going to, we have some other things we want to talk about first. But first of all, before we get going, the most important question that we have to ask everybody is, what are you drinking? So Tracy, what are you drinking tonight? Um, well, actually, I made my own coffee liqueur. So, <laughs> not to brag, right? <laughs> Just no humble brag there. right yeah. there. You got a badass <laughs> over here. <laughs> coffee like first, like cold brewed some coffee and let it sit for a couple of days to get really, really strong. Added some demerara sugar, basically made a simple syrup. Um, added some vanilla, so there's some vanilla in there, and it's been steeping for about four days now, and it's delicious. Oh, that sounds amazing. That's my next project. I've done. I have. Um, I don't know if steeping is the term, but I've like uh, put strawberries in whiskey, mm -hmm. strawberries in bourbon. I put mm -hmm. peaches in bourbon and I've put mangoes in bourbon. All three amazing. And then once um, it was a very cheap scotch and I had very little left. Uh, so I put Earl Grey tea in that scotch. I put oh an God. amazing jar and I put- Love whiskeys and tea. I do it all the time. So good. So just so if anybody's home, like it is the easiest thing um, you may not want to do your entire bottle, but like if you just take a, a cup of it or something and just use one tea bag, like you kind of watch it because it does pull, it extracts the um, flavor very quickly, <laughs> very quickly, but it's delicious. Absolutely. Or you can even make a tea simple syrup and use it for your old fashions and things like that. So yeah. Yep. So good. I recommend figs as well. Yeah. Oh, but I'm a big fig, fig bourbon. Fan. Fig bourbon. So Absolutely. So, all right. so, so that's Mallory. What sorry. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, Mallory, what are you drinking tonight? Uh, I am drinking my uh, platonic life partner, Buffalo Trace. Uh, I actually would be drinking Uncle Nearest, but we just ran out. Oh, no. One of our new favorite bourbons. We could, like, I just love it. It's like my favorite um, sipping whiskey, not bourbon, um, but Buffalo Trace. 
uh, my best friend suggested I start, I, I try it a bunch of years ago and I just, it's just become my, my writing bourbon. Like anytime I have to write, which is all the time, it's been my companion through many a night. And uh, I'm actually drinking it in my girly drinks glass that my best friend also got me um, specifically for the book. So I feel very fancy. That's phenomenal. Glassware. We had Buffalo Trace last time we talked out, we actually ended up talking mm -hmm. about the Trace a little bit. Oh, I love Buffalo Trace. They're, mm -hmm. oh. Hire me, Buffalo Trace. I, they, they don't have a brighter <laughs> residence, but they need one. They That's don't right. Have I, so I started my I started my whiskey journey as a snob. Uh, people have been <laughs> Starting I, at like, the top. No, <laughs> I seriously, I, I, I started, I hated whiskey for most of college. Uh, and then I won a bottle of Blue Label. And so then I had to force my way through that. Didn't really like it. And then I started liking scotch. And then I didn't touch bourbon at all. But then the first couple of bourbons I tried were fancy bourbons. I tried Blanton's and Willet Pot still. And so for the longest time, I would either drink the scotch I had at home or like pay too much to drink scotch at a bar, or I would have this one bottle of Blanton's. Uh, and this is my second bottle that I have here. Oh, and then, <laughs> then uh, I know, don't, don't tell my parents that I keep buying <laughs> bottles of Blanton's. Uh, or it would be Willet Pot still. And then one friend of mine was like, Barsha, have you tried Buffalo Trace? The same distillery makes it. And I was like, really? And I try Buffalo Trace and I'm like, this is it. This is the <laughs> mm -hmm. shit. Yep. Yeah. The first time I tried Buffalo Trace, it was like one of those movie interludes where like the romantic music starts playing and like I'm running across a field and Buffalo <laughs> Trace is running across the other side of the field. And we've been together ever since. You, you know, those movies where like the guy falls in love with the girl just because she loves the Smith. So she's not like other girls. That was me and like Buffalo Trace. That was me and like Elijah Craig. Like I was like, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Amazing. I, I do want to come back to something that Mallory mentioned is that I think every um, distiller needs a writer in residence, though. That's so what I'm I think, saying. Well, I think I mean, we, we need to make that happen for, somehow. For marketing. Does that kind of count? Kind of? Yeah, <laughs> I want them to hire me, Tracy. Come on. I'm okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. I wrote in the acknowledgments of my book for Buffalo Trace to call me. Please. <laughs> <laughs> you need it. No, I swear if I ever actually get into academia and they give me a chance to write a second book after I finish this dissertation and written a book, the second book, I'm going to write to every distillery in Scotland and be like, hey, I'm going to write a global history of brown liquor. I'm beginning with scotch. Uh, let me visit your archives. And then I'll just spend a year. If I visit, you mean move in. Visit, <laughs> I mean move in, I mean taste. And I'll be like, hey, you know, uh, grant people, I need money to taste the whiskey. That's how I really do the research, you know? Well, you understand that once you go over there, they're literally like pouring it down. Your like everybody. Oh! Like, that's what Barsha, this, why this, is, this is the material turn, right? Like this is, yes. this is the next wave of historical yes. analysis anyway. So you're, you're on the cut, you're on the bleeding edge right there. Yeah. yeah. So um, before we forget though, Varsha, what are you drinking tonight? Okay, so I'm starting with Hudson Baby Bourbon. It's uh, it's my sipping with sipping bourbon of choice. Uh, but because we have Tracy on the show, I was like, let me choose you know different whiskeys that I can go through. Uh, so this I bought for my birthday. It's Abelor Abunza. Uh, it is like uh, what is it? It's sixty-one point two proof, sixty-one point two percent, one hundred twenty-two proof. Uh, and then Tracy mentioned this rye. I bought it before Tracy even mentioned it. I was like, it showed. I don't know how the internet is like after me. Like it, and, and this, they advertise this to me and I was like, I'm not gonna buy a random rye, but then I looked at the notes and I was like, this looks really good. It's the Leopold Brothers uh, Bottled and Bond Three Chamber Rye Whiskey. It was, it was a nice birthday present for myself. And then if I, after I have those two, I have the Sexton Irish Whiskey. And then I have a Japanese whiskey, Yamazaki 12. And then if I have time, uh, Indian Whiskey Amrit. It's the Amrit Fusion. Yeah. And then with, with, with historians, we'll continue long past the hour mark. Tonight. Right? <laughs> so. And I mean, if, if for some reason, you know, I, I finish all of these, I, I have much more. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. You You're prepared. Yes. You're prepared. <laughs> historians right. are always prepared. In the chat, I've put my spreadsheet. And so if anybody who's watching wants to know what I listed off, it's in the spreadsheet, in the chat. <laughs> All right, Rachel, what are you what are you drinking tonight? Uh, I have made myself a whiskey rebellion, uh, which is Pim's rye, uh, rye or bourbon, uh, simple syrup, a little bit of lemon, and a little bit of Angostura bitters. 
So Yum. I thought it was appropriate. I didn't know you could do other things with pims. Yeah. <laughs> other than like a pims cup. But that's that's right. Pims cups are delicious, but it actually is a really great mixer. It's yeah. really good. And I am so using good. the resurgent bourbon from um, PA. So fancy. Local. Go Pennsylvania. Yeah. There you go. Nice. So. All right. Well, as I mentioned, I'm drinking some Larceny. I have it in a plastic cup, so but I'm really excited to be here. And it it actually tastes really great in the plastic cup. I mean, it tastes great anywhere, but <laughs> it's just what it is. So anyway, so thank you everyone for joining us. Um, Tra uh, sorry, Rachel is, is going to uh, disappear into the background in just a moment here. But if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A and we will um, get to them uh, during the course of the conversation. So thank you, Rachel. We'll see you soon. So. All right. Um, all right. So Varsha, you, I think you were going to kick us off with a question. Yeah. So last time we had Tracy on, we went over, you know, the difference between bourbon and scotch and generally how whiskey is made. And so I know this is a difficult question, but for people who didn't watch the last time we had you on, what is a general definition of whiskey? Like just general. Absolutely. So one of the things that I really love is when people will talk about, oh, that's scotch, it's not whiskey, or that's bourbon, that's not whiskey. Whiskey is our overhanging category. Basically, everything is whiskey, it's not separate categories. Whiskey itself is a distilled spirit. So basically, it's been boiled and we separate the alcohol from the water. A distilled spirit made from a fermented grain mash. So we took grains, we ground them up, we soaked them in hot water, um, we, we let the sugars break down, that then ferments. We then add our yeast, which starts to make a beer. So that's what we're then distilling. Fermented grain mash. Um, that's uh, it's typically aged in oak cask. All right. So a distilled spirit made from a fermented grain mash, typically aged in oak cask. That is whiskey. So where you go from there is where are the whiskeys made? So specific countries. So Scotland has to be aged three years. Um, there are different categories, whether it's a single malt or a single um, grain or a blended whiskey. Ireland, America, J Japan, Taiwan, uh, Mexico. There are so many amazing places making whiskey right now. And each individual country usually has their own regulations for what constitutes an actual whiskey. Now, when you do go across borders, that can come, sometimes cause some issues. So sometimes us sending our American whiskeys over to Europe where whiskey is a minimum of three years. And for us, it's a minimum of two years for a straight whiskey, not a bourbon a straight whiskey, um, sometimes we have trouble getting those uh, labels that we want on the bottles. Is that good? Yeah. That's okay. amazing. That makes sense I mean, to me. The, Europeans seem very, very finicky about labels too. I mean, like Absolutely. I'm thinking about kind of like food origins and, and stuff like that. So, I mean, that, that makes that makes kind of perfect sense. So, and cool. and, and Mallory kind of to, to build off of this is that it's my understanding that only men are involved in the making of <laughs> yeah. and drinking of whiskey. Like since yeah, the beginning I'm of actually time. kind is of nervous correct? because I think somebody might jump through my window and attack me because I'm drinking whiskey right now. <laughs> I have to do it have, really secretly. I have, I have so many horror stories of me going to a bar or a liquor store and the guy behind the guy, the guy behind the thing is like, when I ask him for recommendations, he's like, are you, are you sure you want to try that whiskey? And I'm like, yeah, bitch. How about I, I some nice birthday whiskey. cake vodka for you? That'll be yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that's the, the funny thing is that's why I started um, writing girly drinks, my book, because I got really into cocktails. And as a, a nerd and as a writer, the first thing I wanted to do was read about them. I was like, all right, my, you know, I want to, I know, I want to know everything. I want to know the history. I want to know the science and I'm reading all these books and I was like, huh, okay. Written by a white dude. Okay. Oh, written by a white dude. Okay. Uh, ooh, ooh. And like started looking through the whole stack and I was like, wait a minute, they're all white dudes. Oh God. Oops. All white dudes. <laughs> And I started getting really frustrated because there were only small, anytime there was any sort of women or people of color history in there, it was like one sentence, you know? And I was like, wait a minute, wait, wait, that's what I want to know about. That's the, that's the thing I care about right there. I want a whole book about it. And I asked my, my best friend, where can I buy a book like this? And she was like, you can't because it doesn't exist. Uh, and I wanted to know how all this happened. I wanted to know women's drinking history, but I also was really curious as to when drinking became so gendered. I'm sure, mm. uh, you know, both Varsha and Tracy can say, you know, we've all had ridiculous stories, both funny and horrifying about being in bars, wanting to drink whiskey, being involved in this stuff and having men just say absolutely ridiculous things. And sometimes other women, because they just like, it's such a gendered thing. And I, I wanted to know when, and the, the, the funny thing is nowadays there's so much gendering of drinking, but really both fermenting alcohol and distilling started out as a very distinctly feminine thing. 
Like it was a, it was a lady thing. Um, Tracy and I talked a bunch yesterday about how, I mean, the three chambered still was invented by a woman, a woman named Mar Maria the Jewess, uh, as she called herself. She was also the first female uh, Jewish author in history. We believe she was an alchemist and as all alchemists wanted to do, they were looking for the elixir of life and she found it liquor. Uh, unfortunately, yes. <laughs> liquor did not make her immortal, um, but she, you know, she invented this distillation chamber. Um, we don't know that much about her. She lived between 100 and 200, year 100 and 200. A lot of the um, records in Alexandria were destroyed. She worked with another female alchemist named Cleopatra, uh, named after the Cleopatra that we all know and, and love and think is very sexy. Um, but yeah, I mean, from go, it started as a feminine thing in, in the 1500s when it first started catching on. Because for a really long time, we people didn't distill alcohol. They didn't think, even if they started to distill alcohol, they were like, they didn't drink it. Yeah. It wasn't like, oh, I've made a tasty beverage. It wasn't until the 1500s when people started to distill wine and realize that they can make distilled liquor. But even then in the 1500s, it was still a feminine thing. You know, um, we were, Tracy and I were talking yesterday and her and, and I and um, another women in the woman in the spirits industry were talking about how often men say, oh, well, go back to the kitchen. You don't belong in alcohol. Well, that's where alcohol was for the longest time, <laughs> was in the kitchen, you know, because yeah. uh, it was such an easy thing to do. Uh, it was small. It was something that you could do, you know, while you're cooking dinner, while you're watching your kids. For the first couple hundred years or so that distilled uh, liquids were around, it was mostly like a domestic product that was made in the home by women. Um, in England, most distillers were women. And it wasn't until it started getting more commercialized that men were like, hold on, we can make some money off this? All right, ladies, get out of here. <laughs> kind of got taken over. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a absolutely. huge bummer, man. Yeah. I mean, the same, the same thing happened with, with fermented uh, liquor, but distilled, it was really, you know, it, it really took off. People were like, this stuff is, is good. This stuff is amazing. And it really, really, I mean, you know, you could drink more of it and get, or drink less of it and get more drunk. Um, you could do more with it. It just, um, it became a huge thing and it got taken away from women. <laughs> So I, I, this is me like from personal experience, but generally anytime I'm reading about, this is not true of all Indian history, but generally whenever my parents are telling me about Indian culture and Indian life and stuff like that, Indian women don't drink. In your research, when you're looking at Europe, like, you know, the 1500s, 1600s, when was it that, or did it ever happen that like, you know, European men are like, you know, women shouldn't be drinking. Did it ever happen in the Western world? Yes. Well, first off, I do want to say there's a bunch of Indian history in my book, Girly Drinks, because <laughs> back around the time when Rome was only drinking wine, people in India had a ton of different kinds of alcohol. They were just like running circles around Rome when yeah. it came to yeah. alcohol. And there's a lot of <laughs> really, really cool. <laughs> It's a lot of really, really cool history there. Um, you know, you can basically track from the beginning of time, like the, the easiest way to tell how a society is going to treat a woman is whether or not she's allowed to drink, where she's allowed to drink, and what she's allowed to drink. Mm. And we, I mean, we still see that today. Um, but in, in, in uh, medieval England, when England first really became a thing, everybody was drinking because, you know, if you drank the water, you'd get diarrhea and die. Um, so everybody <laughs> drank some kind of beer or ale or cider or something. And it was really when it became a commercial thing, because in the medieval times, um, the people who really dominated alcohol making were women, alewives. And it was just like a total, it was the only, truly the only industry that women controlled. No other industry was like that. Because when you think, and even today, um, you, you think of the barrier to entry when it comes to just making stuff at home. You know, it was alcohol was made with things that women already had in their kitchen. It was, again, something that they could do while w watching their kids. It was something that they could do on and off as they needed. Like maybe one woman made some beer and she had too much. So she could just, you know, open her doors and sell it to her neighbors. It was something that was really, you know, completely controlled by women for hundreds of years. And it wasn't until uh, the advent of hops. So hops was a huge, it was like the biggest thing in alcohol since, since before sliced bread. Because the advent of hops, adding hops to beer makes it last longer. It has an antibacterial, pro has anti antibacterial properties along with like, because beer did not taste great back then. It had flavor, which is something, you know, wow, flavor, amazing. Um, and it really was a huge um, technological advance. So once something, all of a sudden, when beer had hops, then it was more antibacterial, it lasted longer. And the thing about that is it could be shipped. 
all of a sudden it could be a commercial product because you could send it off somewhere before it was like mm -hmm. something that was very very local you really couldn't you could there wasn't you couldn't ship beer uh once that happened it became started getting commercialized and of course once that happened then men started to taking taking it over um they started creating laws and uh making a lot of regulations surrounding it because part of the reason why women got into it was that there was no regulation you know they could just get into it they could start making beer in the cauldron in their kitchen and there was not, not a ton of oversight there was some but then all of a sudden they started making these skills and regulations and then women were out um so that's in that sort of um be, happened around the same time as taverns started happening before ale houses were literally women's houses it was just like a house that you served ale in taverns were places that were specifically built especially for um for drinking and for like commercialized drinking but you see it even before the medieval times in rome and ancient greece any time that women are really not allowed in the public life they weren't allowed to drink because from the beginning of time alcohol was very very closely tied to power and social power and because women women are property they're men's property we shouldn't be doing anything and if a woman's drinking she might go have sex with somebody she's really she's operating very independently and well, she, men didn't she, want that she might be a witch right yeah, she could be a witch yeah. I mean, something, something bad's gonna happen she's uncontrollable that's really the thing so i mean the gendering of drinking has been happening happening since ancient greece ancient rome um it, so it's been going on for a really long time and we see different iterations of it and that's what but that's what's so frustrating to me is that you know still today we think of you know especially it's funny that we're talking about whiskey because whiskey and scotch and bourbon especially is like a white dude thing you know you got to have the beer you got to have the pipe you got to have the big library when really for the longest time it was like a lady thing <laughs> I, I just i just wanted to say like, like i that's what really really bothered me about it when i got to college in general is because generally in college you everybody is drinking crappy alcohol in general we're drinking crappy beer if we're wine people we're drinking crappy wine if we're liquor people are drinking crappy liquor but like once you leave college you know people are allowed to like really get into like the stuff they're allowed to get into if they want to drink and so like i have like a bunch of white dude friends because like you know i went to a public university that's elite <laughs> and so there's a bunch of white dudes. <laughs> i live in america and so in college i wasn't that into it i was the girl who was known that for like you know i'd have two shots of vodka and i'd be done and that was, I was that person. And so when people found out, people who I knew in college, people who I knew in high school were like, you like whiskey, but that's that's so weird. You're, you're a girl, like that doesn't make sense. And like this mm. one dude- How was do your like, tiny little hands fit around the bottle? <laughs> dude, this, one dude, this one dude who like, I haven't even talked to in years. Uh, he followed me on Instagram and he's like, whoa, that's a huge whiskey collection. Where did you get all that? Did you like inherit it or something? And I'm like, what do you mean did I inherit it? I paid for all of this. Did it's you huge. inherit it? That is a straight up and then my favorite thing is whenever i um eventually my parents are gonna watch this so i might as well i might as well bring it up. But whenever, so like whenever i tell my parents oh i got i got this as a gift or like you know i bought this for myself my dad will say be like oh no how much did it cost because he's always worried about how much i've spent uh but then he's like yeah can i have a sip my mom would be like why are you drinking why are you drinking right. women don't drink women don't drink uh and so yeah if if you follow my twitter even if I'm not, you know, high on painkillers after having room with his teeth. This is a continuing story on my Twitter. My mom is trying to set me up with an Indian guy. And so every time she tries to set me up, she's like, don't bring up the fact that you drink whiskey. Indian men, they don't like it when their women drink. No. And I was like, that sounds like a personal problem, mom. Uh, <laughs> like, I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, that's I not that like a problem. There are quite a few Indian men who are looking for their partner in crime because like whiskey is such huge thing within the community like no. there's gotta be some guys that are like i want my partner and we're gonna go with this together i absolutely disagree with your mom and i'm sure and, and if it is a thing then that's you know that's not the person for you but I, we're gonna <laughs> find you the one that's like oh my gosh this is this is my sidekick right here like you guys go at it together if we All happen right. to have any listeners that are in india right now india actually has a female wi uh, drink whiskey drinking club called uh i think it's the Nero Club or something like that, the Nero Whiskey, but it's a 100% uh, female focused whiskey drinking club. They provide you free whiskey, free food, and uh, education classes. Like you can just go and hang out with other whiskey drinking ladies uh -huh. and learn about it. It's really, really cool. Nero something, yeah. it's like Nero Whiskey or 
so, something like that. N E R O. It's really, really. Why really did I get American citizenship? This is not. <laughs> this is not a <laughs> Uh, but all of this so, is part of the reason why I was so excited to to meet Tracy and to I don't know Tracy if you want to talk a little bit about the work that you're doing because because of all these weird um, very very untrue assumptions and ideas people have about history they don't realize that not only is uh, booze and whiskey history specifically very diverse and uh, and I don't mean like the the way that a lot of companies think of diversity is just like a bunch of white women but it's like the history of whiskey and drinking is very black very queer yeah. like, there's there's so much going on there and there's so much like so many stories that haven't been told yet and I know Tracy, you're doing a lot of work to not only get those stories told, but sort of change the face of whiskey and, you know, get people realizing that it's not just something for like old people. Absolutely. So I've been doing this for over a decade now. I'm, I'm 31 now. Um, and I, because it's been really, because when I fell in love with whiskey, there wasn't anybody really around that looked like me that, that was, that was from the same background. I was definitely always in the oddball. I was the only one in, in every situation and it just felt uncomfortable sometimes. And there were situations that really made me feel uncomfortable and unsafe. And I wanted to change that and ensure that the next time I brought a friend or the next time somebody stumbled upon a whiskey tasting that they felt comfortable and that the community was welcoming. So I started my own community. So we started, I had started Worski with a woman named Jennifer Wren and we created whiskey events and, and they were fun and they were for everybody. It didn't matter what you looked like, it didn't matter your age, it didn't matter who you were. You could come and learn about whiskey and feel comfortable among us. From that, I got became a brand ambassador. I think it's important to see yourself represented. It, 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 it absolutely is, it just changes the way that you um, move through the world when you realize like that is a position I can be and that is something I can enjoy because that person is already doing it. And not only are they enjoying it, they're teaching about it. They're now the person that I'm going to for advice. They are the person who is, is perceived to be an expert on the topic. And now that I'm working with this nearest and Jack advancement initiative, not only is Fawn Weaver the first black CEO, black woman CEO of a major whiskey brand, she is also the head of a C, of a C suite of a board that is all women on a whiskey team. Like this is unheard of, and they've given me the ability to now gain as much knowledge as I can to become a head distiller of a distillery. Like this is all things that are that have been on my my wish list. These are all things that I've hoped to see happen within the industry. And while I'm doing what I'm doing, I'm also creating new avenues for other people and trying to ensure that I'm, I'm building up roads behind me as I walk forward. And I can't wait to see what how much this industry changes and becomes more colorful and more inclusive uh, in the next 10 years, because it is gonna take a little bit longer than just like a couple, probably more than a decade, um, but it's happening. And I have people reaching out to me every day asking, how can I get into this? What can I do next? And I'm excited to see what's going to happen and who we're going to have and who are the next stars that are coming up. I also yeah. though, am looking to the women who have come before me who never got a spotlight, right? So I'm currently working with Sherry Moore who for 30 years worked at Jack Daniels and is now the director of whiskey at, at Uncle Nearest. Um, there's Nicole Austin who's at George Dickel who just won a million awards for the George Dickel Bottled and Bonded. She's like a close mentor who I go to with questions about all sorts of weird water systems and water treatments. And it's really, really wonderful to have that. And just as we go along, Joyce Spence, who's in your book, um, Joyce yes. Spence for Appleton, uh, first black. So starstruck <laughs> talking to her. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So we got to talk. We're on a panel with her and it, yeah, it's, it's absolutely awestruck. That's how I felt. It's amazing. And actually she was one of the first women to tell me you have this passion and I think that you should actually pursue the mm. process. I, like I was an ambassador, but she's like, make the whiskey. Like, why are you just talking about it? Make it. And I held on to that. And so I told her yesterday, I was like, you told me this. She's like, yeah, I tell, I tell women they should. I was like, okay, so I'm not special. <laughs> <laughs> you are special though. <laughs> so you just tell everybody, awesome, great. But it really did mean something to me. And I've taken that and I tried to run with it. And I tried to do the same thing with anybody that's coming my way. Just give them that passion. Let them know that this world is ready and open for you as well. Yeah. Well, could I, if I could follow up on that a little bit, is, is actually maybe a question for both uh, Mallory and for Tracy, is that um, one of the things, Tracy, we talked about uh, last time when you were on the show is about kind of the interna internationalization of whiskey, right? Like how there are so many, and you mentioned this at the very beginning, again, like how many, there's so many places that are making whiskey now and especially exceptional whiskey. And it's, it's really kind of broadening its appeal and in kind of a way that it, it hadn't kind of before. But um, 
I wonder too if if kind of and this is this is kind of where Mallory's work kind of comes in is that if you're seeing a, a resulting change in the audience or the people who are drinking whiskey as well, like has that significantly changed? Do you think in the last ten or twenty years, or are we still kind of stuck in in this in, in which it, it, you know whiskey still is perceived as a predominantly white male drink or something like that, or is it is it is it really kind of shifting perceptions? It's start, definitely starting, it, it's still mostly marketed to white white males. Sure. That's the, that's the frustrating thing is that um, I think like Tracy said, um, you don't have to convince women that hard, you know, what, mm -hmm. no matter what kind of woman they are, no matter what race or they're, they're, like, it doesn't matter. Like women are are totally cool with whiskey. It's, um, you, you just have to include them in your marketing plans luckily there's a lot of really really great groups out there that are trying that, that are showing um alcohol companies whiskey companies specifically that like hey there's a market here you just have to like consider us as people and consider us in your marketing plans um but big ships turn very slowly um i have not seen uh as much change you know there's everyone you, you see one ad with a woman with whiskey and everyone's like oh women are taking over like not realizing that the million other ads are like you know yeah. still still towards men i think it's getting i mean Tracy, you can build on this but you know i think it's getting better but it's definitely not e close to where it needs to be yeah it's definitely getting better and there's actually a group um called our whiskey and what they're doing is every year they're going through it and really kind of looking through especially scotch whiskey marketing to see how much of it is is men and how much of it is women. So I think that this year was the closest that they've gotten to actually being kind of close to being 50-50. I think it was around 70% men and 30% women. Um, but that's actually not too far off of actually who's drinking. So it's about 40% of women are the consumers for, for whiskey. So that's not too bad, right? So if that's actually where we're sitting currently, um, I'm not super upset because I know how far we've come. Like there was a time when seeing a woman on, a, on an ad that wasn't just in something skimpy or wasn't serving her husband was absolutely unheard of. One of the things that actually made me really excited about the Glenfiddich brand was back in like 2016 or 2017, they did an ad and they had a black woman with natural hair and she was talking to her dad who was building a guitar and she poured him a glass of Glenfiddich scotch and was like, here dad. And I, I literally started crying. Like I couldn't, I started crying because I, for the first time felt like that's me. Like I, that is literally like, that's a black woman, natural hair. Like she knows about whiskey. Her dad doesn't drink. Like that is literally my life. And it was so exciting to see that. And I think that's happening much more. I love Morgie has a really, really awesome ad that they're doing. That's kind of like sixties pop. Yeah. Right. So, so cool. uh, but I also think we've got some misses. I, I still don't like Jay Walker. I still don't think that we need to do these things. They're through the TTB. There was something that came through from Newark that they're making a whiskey just for women, created by women. But I don't think we need the to. The bottle's going to be smaller. The writing's going to be I, simpler pink. so we can it understand it. You know. It was pink. I was like, the bottle was pink. It was like that Bic, you know, the, when Bic came out yeah. with yes, it for women? Yes. I, the Lady Legos. Yeah. Because women can't use Legos, apparently, right? Like, that's, that's, yeah, very, especially when we're talking about women who our pellets are meant to be drinking whiskey. Like we are attuned. We have this really great ability to be able to pick up notes because we are in the kitchen here. Yes, there are actual physical reasons that are, are but it, on top of it, because we are constantly smelling specific spices and fruits and vegetables, we just have a, we are attuned to picking up those tasting notes. So why are you dumbing down the whiskey for somebody who actually can pick it apart much better than you can? Sorry, well, man. I love you very much. <laughs> what's frustrating to me is that still, basically, since whiskey could be sold in bottles at the grocery store, it's been the major the majority of people who buy liquor are women. Yeah. The, most mm -hmm. of the people who are responsible for the booze purchases of a home are are women. And it wasn't until I sixties or sixties or seventies or maybe even eighties that the Distilled Spirits Council in the United States actually forbid women being shown drinking in ads which is absolutely nuts. That's why it took so long. We're still, I mean, we're literally, we're, we're 100 years behind. We're, we're doing our best to catch up here. Um, but it's one of the reasons why I wanted to, I, I do the work that I do is that it's as great. Like I, I love so much all the work that everyone's doing to push and get more women. I really want women to know that we've always been here. Like we have a history here. It's not as if like, oh, it's this new thing that we're all learning about. Like, 
I mean, we we've been here four men were, you know, we invented a lot of this stuff. Absolutely. I, I mean, during prohibition there, especially in America, um, prohibition left this really interesting mark in that people, it, it really made people think that, you know, women were the ones who were fighting for temperance. Whenever you hear stories about prohibition, it's always like, oh, it was women's fault. Women got the right to vote. And they're the ones who like, who voted against alcohol. And that's act actually the opposite of what happened. It was a group Not of women who all. were the ones that were responsible for prohibition getting repealed. And it was mostly female players during prohibition that were serving alcohol, going to serving speakeasies, throwing cocktail parties, bootlegging, smuggling. I mean, the, the phrase, you know, the real McCoy came from a uh, very, very famous bootlegger named Bill McCoy, who is like one of the most infamous bootleggers in the country. He got his booze from a bootlegger named Cleo Lifego. And she, she smuggled this incredible, like real scotch and real whiskey in from the Bahamas. And the reason he got such a great reputation is because he was selling people her booze. Like, I mean, there, there's just so many amazing stories of, of female bootleggers. There's one, her name is um, Birdie Burton. Like her name, her nickname was like Birdie. And she was one of the first black uh, female homesteaders in Montana. And she made her living by bootlegging. She lived alone with her cat in this homestead in Montana and she sold whiskey to the entire community. And her homestead is still there. I think it's near a place called Lewiston, Lewistown. And like, there's like all these spooky ghost stories that like, if you go there, you can still see her cat and the windows and stuff. But like, it uh, there were so many women doing it and not just like white women, able-bodied women. It was just like women of all kinds who were literally keeping alcohol alive. Like part of the reason why co cocktail culture, actually I would venture to say that most of the reason why cocktail culture survived during prohibition is because of women. Oh, absolutely. So you're telling me, so you're telling me Boardwalk Empire is incorrect and telling me that Steve Buscemi is, <laughs> is, is like, is the reason for bootlegging. <laughs> well, I mean, and especially in larger places, yes, men were involved, but you, you gotta think, especially like in the communities, if this was a way for women to make money. So like yes. just Mallory talked about earlier, you were able to do this in your kitchen in privacy, but this was a way that people made a lot of money during prohibition and during the depression. And, and women were the ones that were doing that. Um, I was actually looking through some records some his and talking, it was basically New Orleans and talking about all the different people who got arrested. And there are so many women who got arrested and they're like, but I don't have a husband and I have to take care of my kids. And people were like, okay, you know, so like- yep, this That's exactly what happened. Yeah. So, and also bad thing about Bertie Brown, she actually died because- um, Yeah. She, yeah. <laughs> while she was, was distilling the hair, it still exploded and, and it- Ooh. So distillation is very dangerous. And that is why we know it's, it's dangerous, it's dirty, it's hot. It, that's why mm -hmm. it's in the kitchen. Um, that's also why we know that black labor was used. That's why we know that slaves were, were an integral part of making whiskey and growing the bourbon industry. And so that's something that we're doing a lot of research more and more is being discovered every day. But because we had no real leverage, like we had, we were property, um, very little of what we achieved, what we um, innovated is actually given credit to us. So mm -hmm. I, I, as much as I would love to be able to tell you all of these wonderful stories about all of these black distillers who changed the way that we did something, it's impossible because it's gonna, it's gonna always go to whoever owned that slave. However, we do have Nearest and that's at least a good start. We know he is now, he has actually been given credit as the first master distiller for Jack. So they have actually like moved, they had numbers for all their distillers, they actually moved them to ensure that Nearest Green is the first one. So that's all. I have a question because Mallory, you mentioned this a little bit earlier and it sort of fits into we can get into audience questions. You have two great, really great audience questions. And if you have audience questions, please put them in. But you mentioned a little bit earlier that drinking alcohol was associated with power. How does that fit into the American story after prohibition ends, right? Because like I'm thinking the first time that I really saw people drinking whiskey besides my dad drinking the occasional Jack Daniels at home when I was like in high school. But like when I saw it on TV or in movies, it would be like stuff like Mad Men. And like they're, you know, it's in the 60s and like men are in ad companies and they're having a glass of scotch after they've done their work. When does it happen in America that drinking whiskey or drinking in general is associated with power? And therefore like, cause like you do see women drinking a lot because women, they have to stay in the home in like the 50s and 60s and they, they're, drink, they're drinking on their own. You know, yeah. they have their Valium and they have their, 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 their cocktail. <laughs> 
Yeah, so it was a really interesting changeover that happened after prohibition during the 40s, 50s. But drinking in America, drinking being associated with power in America basically started ever since like white settlers colonized this country. Because so much of drinking was at least drinking in public was was tied to being in public. And that wasn't something that women were really allowed to do. There were bars that allowed Native Americans, women, um, black people, enslaved people, um, you know anybody that wasn't like a rich white dude, but they were considered like basically our version of a dive bar. Like they were like disorderlies instead of orderlies. Orderlies were what taverns were called for, um, when America as we know it first started. But it was really, it was so much tied to community power because the taverns were really the only place that you could go to like get community news, talk to other people. I mean, so much of women's drinking culture, which is why we don't have as much history on it, was in the home, in private, in, away from the public eye, in the kitchen. It, you know, right nowadays, we always love to make fun of like, oh, women who have their book clubs and they drink more wine than read books. But like, that's the only place that women were able to drink for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, and that, that continued. So prohibition was a really, really interesting time because it's like that quote from Watchmen because you know women had been drinking in private forever since for hundreds and hundreds of years and now only people could only drink in private and it's like that quote from Watchmen like you're not I'm, I'm not stuck in here with you you're stuck in here with me you know so it's really <laughs> it was the first time where women were allowed into public drinking spaces um you know there were there was a huge racial divide between different um different types of drinking places. There was a huge class divide because drinking was like so much more exorbitantly expensive than it was before. Um, and that was really the first time where women were allowed in. Um, we were talking about this a little bit yesterday, but it was the, all of a sudden people kind of wanted women around, uh, um, you know, d d it, whether it was a white club or a black club, because police were less likely to bust a place because they're like, oh, women don't drink. There's a bunch of women in there. They can't be drinking. I mean, pl places were still busted, but they really wanted women around. And then after prohibition, they were, everyone was sort of sitting around going, well, the women were like, well, we're not leaving. We're not, not going to go to bars anymore. This is like part of our culture. Uh, so what happened was that's when in America specifically drinks themselves became gendered. And all of a sudden, very sterile, austere, masculine drinks sort of became a thing. And that, that's when it became like, oh, it's a powerful thing to drink a martini or to drink some whiskey straight. Um, and it's like, oh, just like a silly girly thing to drink something with a lot of garnishes on it or a lot of sugar in it or whatever. When in reality, it shows that the most popular drink with women after prohibition was the old fashioned. And more and more women were drinking whiskey straight than anything else. But when men can't keep women out of the drinking space, they keep them out of the drinks themselves because there's this like sort of power and prestige and, um, you know, serious, like they're considered, you know, adult drinks, serious drinks. Um, and even after prohibition, um, there was sort of, they're like, okay, well, we can't keep women out of the bars. Well, what can we do? They started, you know, women can only be in the bars after lunch meetings have happened. They can only be in the bar after three or before three. They can't be in a bar unescorted. I mean, stuff like that happened until the, the 70s, you know, and, and 80s. It was like a bunch of the like second wave feminists, Be uh, Betty Friedan, Karen DeCrow, um, Gloria Steinem. These were women who had bar sit-ins and protests, you know, there was, it's something that's sort of still ongoing now, but it, I mean, it was still happening, you know, in our lifetimes, depending on how old you are. <laughs> yeah. that's, a, that's a really interesting point. I mean, one of the things that, so I, I'm a medieval historian. And so one of the things that, that we always talk about is that the way that um, uh, uh, power is, is labeled, uh, or, or sorry, power is written onto space. Right, and so like kind of how you're, how you're talking about is that, you know, there are certain places in which men have power and then the w women are written out of those spaces. And so even places where they used to be formally allowed, they're, they're systematically excluded in order so that that becomes a place, a locus of power for, for men. It happened like in the late middle ages and then, you mm -hmm. know, you're kind of describing a similar situation. Um, the one thing I'd like to, to talk about a little bit more is how race works here as well. Right, because we're not just talking about kind of gender, but we are talking about race as well. Like, so, you know, have you in your, you know, in your book or, you know, kind of Tracy, like we've talked about a little bit about this in the past as well. Um, you know, how does race work with kind of spaces and how, you know, kind of uh, Black Americans, Native Americans um, have been systematically excluded or how have they been kind of, uh, you know, worked into this history of, of, um, of spirits in the United States? Yeah, well, 
because whiskey was such a was, was the opportunity to make a, a lot of money um it was actually written into law that black people couldn't own distilleries in a lot of states um we were not allowed to have stills that was illegal um you were unable to sell alcohol we had much higher um punishments for for drinking alcohol for being around alcohol again because we also saw the 13th amendment so we wanted people to become slaves so if you were caught drunk you became a slave because you were then sent to jail um, but what happened is it created another under sort of underground. So while there are moonshiners, everyone thinks of bootleggers, they think of them as being these like country white boys. There was an entire underground that was all black, that was, that was black bootleggers that were making their own things. A lot of them actually connected with, with white men who would literally just be the cover for them and allow them, and they would make the, the whiskey and sell it to them. Also mm -hmm. juke joints. So juke joints would be further out into the woods. They, we would supply alcohol, they would have barbecues, they, but they had their own separate private places that, that were away from white communities because they were so dangerous at this time. Um, when you were drinking, when you were you know, in, in large groups, when you were dancing, music, those sort of things would attract a lot of violence. So that also kept them separate. Um, as we started to get into the 40s and the 50s and, and as people were coming back from war and were realized like they were being treated so much better over in Europe, we're able to drink and discovered cognac, which is why there's a whole thing around black community and cognac, by the way, it is not just because Hennessy and Hennessy, there was a huge connection to Europe anyways, um, but whiskey, but bars and the spirits industry became also something that people fought for. There was a riot in Harlem because they wouldn't allow black um, salesmen to actually take the territory and make money selling whiskey and mm. all sorts of incredible stories about how the finances again so while women were written out of absolutely black um, and, and minority communities were written out i'm not as familiar with native americans unfortunately um but i have been doing more of the research just on on the black community and how they were treated and how it's related to alcohol mallory do you have any sort of insights i have so much <laughs> yeah. Um, go. yeah i mean basically your access to either drink or sell alcohol just sort of basically goes down a line of different types of marginalization. Um, I mean, I th in Canada, I think until ooh, sometime, I forget, I think it was like until the 1960s, to, in order to prove that you could be a citizen, you ha if you were a Native American, you had to prove a sobriety test. Like, mm. and you were, I mean, and, and they also were not allowed to buy or sell alcohol until the 1960s. I mean, it's really atrocious stuff. And you saw this really interesting thing happening. I think it was around mid, late, mid or late 1700s in America where there was this new advent of a different type of place to drink, the hotel. And then it sort of split between hotels and saloons. And saloons were like the lower, lower class place to drink. <laughs> the hotels were the upper class place to drink. But so all the white dudes were like, okay, how can we keep everybody we don't want out? And that's when they, this sort of um, thing happened where they're like, well, we'll take white women, but as long as they're rich, you know, and they came up with all kinds of like, you know, and, and we still see this, you know, there are still bars today that don't let black people drink in them. You know, there was, I think, I, I forget where it was, but it was a case seven years ago, less than five years ago, where um, bars would not al allow a black man to go into their back room to drink. I mean, this stuff is, it's, we're talking about history, but it's not in the past. This is very, very much alive right now. Um, Often using but, dress codes, right? To yeah, well, that was, that's yeah. what I was going to say. They were like, okay, yeah. well, we'll figure out a way, um, dress codes, hair codes, all, you know, anything that wasn't coded as white yeah. was thought of as low class. It's not be allowed to be in here. And that's where it really started to be like, okay, well, we'll have women. Oh, like their idea of, of diversity in hotels in the 1700s was like, ooh, we have Protestants and Catholics. Wow, we're so <laughs> diverse in here. And I mean, it, that ooh, stuff wow. sort of starts to yeah starts to lessen a little bit as time goes on but that those are the sort of techniques that people use to keep people out of hotels because when you think about drinking really comes down to community you know mm -hmm. it, it started that way it's always going to be that way and it's community power public drinking spaces are places of power it's where meetings happen it's where networking happens it's where it's where news is disseminated and people in power always want to keep marginalized people out of those spaces they don't want them to have business meetings they don't want them to to be able to network they don't want those things. And uh, again, we're, we're still seeing that sort of stuff today, but it really, really, I mean, it started as soon as America started. And there are, kind of, like Tracy said, there's all kinds of amazing stories of, um, you know, just loads and loads of black distillers. There's lots and lots of cases of Native Americans who would buy alcohol and then sell it. Because something, a lot of the myths that we have and preconceptions we have around Native American drinking is 
just absolute racist bullshit. You know, there are, you know, there's no genetic predisposition to alcohol. There's a lot of Native American tribes that actually made and drank alcohol before white colonizers got here and they were doing just fine. Like it really, it, it's all about who's telling the story here. Um, but I mean, since it, all of it started in Mesopotamia and it, it, that's, that's when it was the code of Hammurabi was the very, very first time where there was set into law, like who can drink and who can drink. There's actually a, a rule in the Code of Hammurabi that says any godly women are not allowed to drink or they will be burned to death. And up until that point, it was all priestess and like women who controlled the alcohol community and alcohol making, they're the ones who sold it, they're the ones who did everything. And it was that code, which everyone's like, oh, hooray, it started civilization. Well, it actually literally started the patriarchy. And it, it's been sort of like that ever since. And you can find out women and everybody drinking alcohol and making alcohol at any single um, uh, country, community, um, you know, group of people all over the world, but you in those spaces, you'll always find colonizers, anyone who's in power, trying to control who's allowed to drink. I mean, you see it in Mexico, all over South America, in Korea, in Vietnam, in Japan, China, everywhere. Um, so it's it's just so closely tied to social power, economic power, sexual power, um, reproductive power. And so all you have to do is like scratch the surface of this stuff. And it's like, oh, racism, oh, misogyny. Okay, like that's <laughs> that's really all it is. When I started writing girly drinks, I was like, oh, I just want to figure this stuff out because I'm a nerd and a feminist and I want to I want to know all this stuff. And I was like, ooh, this is so much more than I thought it was. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, in, in the case of India, like, it was just generally a cultural thing that, like, I think, for, like, most of the 80s and most of the 90s, in Indian bars that are anywhere in Indian urban cities, the bars are mostly male. There's, mm -hmm. like, women are not really allowed there. Only recently have women been allowed. And it's only, like, the past, like, since 2000, there have been, like, a couple of cases where finally they're, like, okay, we can't ban women from being bartenders. The Indian Supreme Court is, like, Damn it, we can't ban women from being bartenders. They sure try though. <laughs> they sure did try. And then, damn it, we can't ba bar women from going into bars. And so it really does take a long time. Um, and then so I just wanted, to, there was a really good question from uh, from the audience. Uh, Jim sort of asked about this Asian myths about like Asians not being able to metabolize alcohol. But I sort of want to add to that question about like in your research, when you were looking at, you know, maybe Chinese immigrants or Japanese immigrants who are coming into the United States, Mallory, or, or Tracy, when you're looking at your research about who's buying whiskey today, how big is the Asian market, right? Because like there's so much prejudice out there about Asians and alcohol. Um, I heard it a lot because Berkeley is, we have an Asian heavy population near Berkeley. And so I, I heard that prejudice a lot, but like I, I know a lot of Asian people, East Asian people who had no problem drinking alcohol. So based on history as well as present day, what what do you have to say about this idea about like, you know, Asians don't really drink alcohol. They don't bullshit. really metabolize it differently. Yeah, it is bullshit, yeah. I know. <laughs> it's, it's just complete bullshit. I mean, it, 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 in any Asian country, it tracks the same as any other country in the world. The more... so. I mean, the, the, the amount and ability that people, that women and anybody has to drink is really directly tied to their levels of poverty, their income levels and their, their freedom. You saw more women in America drinking in bars when birth control became a thing. And you saw, <laughs> I know, I'm not afraid. And, and, and in China and Japan, you saw much more women going out to bars when they started using birth control. They were getting hired more. I mean, that's really all it is. The, there's this myth that like certain people don't like to drink or they, they can't handle drinking is all all of this is racism like just it's just racism wearing a silly mustache like trying to pretend that it's something else it's there's no no race or no group of people who can't handle alcohol you know some people might um you know they there might be different kinds of alcohol that people like you know we every every community has its own alcohol but it's like it's that's a cool thing but it doesn't there's no there's no people in the entire world that like can't drink it's just the more that you um, give people freedom and protection that's another thing too is that it's also it's, it's believed very frequently like oh well I don't see Asian women or black women or native women in bars because they're not fucking safe 
like because it's scary like everyone loves to make fun of women like oh you're all going to the bathroom in a group yeah because they don't want to get fucking raped okay it's not because like we can't be by ourselves it's really it, like if you look at I don't know, the, today, the numbers of Asian and Black women who drink, they drink less in public spaces because they're not as safe there. You know, they're much more uh, uh, liable to be, to, you know, be preyed upon by some creepy drunk guy. So they're doing what millions and millions of women of all races all over the world have done and then drank at home safely where no one's going to fucking bother them. You know, it's really all, all of those numbers, all those things are just, they're just prejudice. Yeah. yeah this is like a whole this is a whole other hour of conversation but we could go into queer bars as well because like yeah. oh. the, my favorite so much bar cool in berkeley, queer drinking history <laughs> yeah because like, my favorite bar in berkeley like i thought you know there's a bunch of amazing whiskey bars in san francisco there's a great whiskey bars in berkeley and oakland but my favorite bar in oakland and berkeley is white horse it's a lesbian bar it's the best bar in berkeley it's like basically a dive bar, but like, it's so safe. Be if yeah. you're gay, straight, lesbian, whatever, it doesn't matter. But like you go in and you feel safe because of its history there, because of how long it has been a lesbian bar, right? And so that's a whole separate equation. But yeah, like that's, yeah. If, if people haven't read Gay New York, you should definitely read Gay New York. It's a great book. But if you want to understand how like gay people sort of like interacted in the world of New York City, it's a great book to start with. That'd be great. I'm sorry if you can hear my cat. <laughs> okay. um, we had we're, we're unfortunately running just a, a little bit short on time, oh, yeah. but oh, um, there, it just goes so quickly. So funny. Um, yeah. But um, we had another great audience question um, from Hillary, who was asking about kind of foodways and and liquor. Um, and I want to I want to kind of kind of tweak it a little bit in a way because one of the things that that Tracy we've been we've been trying to talk about. I mean, since you've been here, but I, and I know that um, I think Mallory, you know, you talk about it in your book, is about cocktails. And about cocktail culture specifically, like because I think that's that that seems to be a little bit different. Like Mallory, you mentioned this a little bit about kind of uh, mixed drinks, about the old fashioned being, you know, kind of uh, the, the 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 drink that women preferred after prohibition as well. Like, so how does how do those kind of things relate? Like, a, a specific, not just kind of the making of distilled spirits, but but the crafting of different types of drinks, like at bars or at homes or something like that, and and especially the marginalized community about women, African Americans, and and people like that. So. I mean, it, well, but I, we did we did kind of briefly discuss this before, but because um, the 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 enslaved people were the the head of hospitality, like they mm -hmm. created what hospitality is today. They created those cocktails. They created how to be served. They created a lot of the dishes that are served, and with, through that dining we were able to get a lot of these cocktails. So just one of the, the most known is the mint julep, which we know was something that was created by slaves and is something that is incredibly appreciated today and is, is a staple. Um, but there are a lot of cocktails that were created by people of color that have now just become a part of, of our regular cocktail world and lore that we don't necessarily give them credit, but they were just the norm. Um, I, I, I I'm, don't know, I'm sorry. I mean, that, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> That yeah. does make a lot of sense because generally, like I'm, I'm reading. This is a random. This is a fiction book. I'm reading Tanahesi Coates's *The Water Dancer*, right? And it's oh. about an enslaved boy, and it's coming of age story. But like, even that story, and even if you read, you know, they were her property, which we talked with Stephanie Jones Rogers a couple of weeks ago about her book. But generally, like women who owned enslaved people, they had a different relationship with enslaved people than like the men who owned enslaved people, and then enslaved people who lived in the house who were like. Um, you know, who worked in the house versus who worked in the fields had a different relationship with their masters. And so it just makes complete sense that, that like all of the all of the products that they create for their masters are not, you know, they're not they're not given credit for. It just makes a lot of sense. And recently I was watching a YouTube YouTube video about all these cocktails I could make because you know, Matthew kept talking about how I should be putting ice in my bourbon and I should be drinking cocktails. And I was like, fine, let me watch a video on making cocktails. Maybe I'll buy a cocktail set. And you know, they were talking about the mint julep. And then I looked up the mint julep and I was like, yeah, the mint julep was actually made by an enslaved person. Like, why the heck is this? Why the heck is this the official drink of the Kentucky Derby? Like, what the hell? It, yeah. it made no sense to me. And so, well, yeah. I was going to say, one of my favorite ways to describe the Kentucky Derby is in that new book, Pappy Land. It's basically like a, a renaissance festival for rich white people. It's just like <laughs> so <laughs> real. I, uh, like, oh, sorry. Yeah. I was just going to say, but like, another thing is I... um 
I wasn't really a cool person in high school, so I don't know if, how many other people drank in high school, but I didn't drink at all in high school. And so what I learned about drinking in high school was from TV. And so, like, Sex in the City taught me that, like, I was supposed to love, like, Long Island iced teas and, like, Manhattan and Cosmos. And I, I hate those. Like, the, despite, like, the Negroni, like, I would rather <laughs> puke than drink a Negroni. You know what I mean? Right. So, like... So like there, so I, I was just wondering, I think that's probably what Matthew was asking was like, how did some people, maybe it was, maybe it was capitalist people who make vermouth, the verm- big vermouth or like big, big Campari, vermouth, big Campari, big, you know, big bitters, the big bitters industry. How did they decide that, you know, things like Cosmos and Manhattans were like, or like the, what is it? The uh, Island on the beach or sex on the beach or something is like a women's drink. Uh, is, there, is there like is there no, literature on that yeah that's definitely yes. mallory's research on things being yeah. gendered but i wanted to quickly to say when you look at high the reason that the drinks i would love to talk about the cocktails, but even more like you really see um things being adopted through if you saw high on the hog or if you've actually read the book they talk about how i was just going to suggest that because it's yes, so good. how white women actually took the recipes from their cooks and created recipe books and said i made this yes <laughs> you yes, know 100%. so like it's just been, it's just, we were property. We were property. That's probably and what I raised that, my, both my middle fingers right now too. But, mm-hmm. you know, so then as we started to become free and we were able to create books about Southern cooking, that, that there was a wave that kind of came around and I think it was the 50s and 60s where there, that where Black people actually started re- releasing um, books on Southern cooking that were, the Black women actually released them that, that became popular and there was a wave for a while around that. But even before that, you have like books on people on keeping a household. And I thought it was really interesting that, yeah. <laughs> that some of that was like, how do you take care of your slave? Like, how do you, how do you teach them? You know, how, how do they, how do you manage them on top of then what the slaves actually did and talking about like the work that was actually done and taking that, those techniques and those innovations created by enslaved people and making that your own. So there's a lot, it is in the food, it's in, it's in our hospitality through, throughout from, from entering into a home, entering into a restaurant until you leave. Like a lot of those steps of service were created by enslaved people and are still used today. Yeah, you can, you can trace a lot of different food and alcohol things just by the paths that enslaved people took. Uh, I write in Girly Drinks a little bit about how, um, and, and not just because not just in America, there were enslaved people that were brought from Africa to Peru and they took those uh, beer making tech those women took the beer making techniques that they had in South Africa and mixed it with the chicha making techniques from Peru so you have this like, really interesting blend of afro peruvian beer making and I mean that's you, same thing you can trace it in America again highly highly recommend high on the hog it's absolutely fantastic but there's so many I mean there's evidence that some of the first cocktails ever made in America were enslaved teenage girls who would mix things with their whiskey way way before um, Melinda Russell I think her name is in 1862 or something. The very, very first um, cookbook called the Book of Receipts ever released in the United States by a Black person had alcohol, like had alcohol recipes in it that people would just take. Um, so, that, I mean, it's a, you, can, you can trace a lot of those things, different um, things that are you, different ingredients, different techniques, all those things. You can just sort of, oh, where did they take enslaved people and just follow it through the country? Yeah. Yeah. So I think, uh, unfortunately, I, I think we are yeah. out of time. Like, one, did you have one more thing, Varsha? Go ahead. One Go ahead. more thing. So Mallory and Tracy, you guys are both whiskey fans. And a lot of people who are probably watching are whiskey fans. You guys, tomorrow, you go to a liquor store, you're allowed to buy any whiskey you want, you know, and it's in the store. It's like, it's available in the store. It costs under $150. What whiskey do you buy? But it's so one bottle, know. right? Well, so it's one, like bottle. one thing. Why does it have to be under 150? Because I really want to talk about this brew chamber still with you. Oh, okay. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about it. Okay. So I bought this for my birthday and Tracy wants to talk about it. So Tracy would like to buy this bottle and she's getting it. I have bought this bottle. It is on the way to me. So this is a really, really exciting thing for anyone that, is, that appreciates the history of whiskey. So Todd Leopold has a distillery called Leopold Brothers, which he opened with his brother. Um, he has been distilling for a long time. They are in Washington. They actually have, what's well, one of the cool things, yay. Um, they they have all sorts of interesting things. So their mash tons with, are actually oak, which is something that is a throwback. And a lot of people just use steel, it's easier to clean, but that oak can sometimes maintain a little bit of bacteria and change the flavors of your whiskey. So he has oak wash backs. 
um, where fermentation is happening. He also has big, huge windows that are open to a, an orchard. So all of that, that yeast, all of the things that are flowing through the wind are going to get into your, your fermentation and, and affect the flavors that are created there. Also, they have their own on-site malting. So if they're taking barley that's grown locally, they are malting it on-site. And this three-chamber still is taking all of these things, plus an Abruzzi rye, which is a specific type of rye that was used back at the turn of the century. It is only about 62% starch, whereas today we're able to get our starch and our rice up to 80%. So that means we're able to get a higher yield. But you're losing a lot of the oils and the flavors that are in those ryes. So he's taking this, this rye and mixing with that malt and putting it into three chamber stills. So we know about our column stills and our pot stills. We learned about that last week. Pot still, big round, you boil, goes up through the top. Your column still, the different plates, boils, condenses, boils, condenses, all the way to the top. This is three large chambers, almost like three pot stills sitting on top of each other. Now that's only important because as that uh, so basically you put your mash in the top, so you put your beer in the top and it gets heated and then it falls into the first chamber and second and third. So your first, it's kind of heating through there, goes to your second and heats through there, goes to your third and heats through there. As it's falling, it's picking up pressure. It's getting, it's higher temperatures in the bottom. So as you're coming through and that bottom chamber is boiling, it's getting up to like 220 degrees Fahrenheit. Whereas in your column still, the highest you tend to get is to like 150, I mean, 185. Um, you don't wanna go over 190 on your column stills. So you're not able to get as high of a temperature. When you're not getting as high of a temperature, you're not pulling as much of those water soluble components or those oils out of your whiskey. So you're actually pulling the oils out of that bottom chamber and it's, it's evaporating up into your whiskey. So your whiskey that's gonna come out of there has a very different flavor. Now he only decided to create this three chamber still because he was looking at um, records, IRS records about distilleries that were at the turn of the century. And almost every single rye distillery had this thing called a three chamber still. What was that? So he started looking it up and actually found some drawings but nobody had ever made one in the 19th century, like in the 20th century. <laughs> So he went to Vendome and was like, hey, can you guys make this? They're like, yeah, we can make it, but we can't ensure it'll work because nobody made it. Nobody knew what to do with it. So they, he worked for like five years. They made this still. And this is the first bottle that is coming off the still. It is incredibly exciting. It is, we, this type of whiskey. Why the it. hell did I not buy two bottles? I understand that it was expensive. Right. And it was my birthday and I was allowed to buy one bottle, but I bought four. But like, I should have bought two <laughs> bottles of this and forgot the other bottle. It's, it's so good. I'm having it right now. It's, I, um, what was it? I was telling people before we started recording that I had a date, right? Who came over and he was like, oh, I want to try this. And I was like, no, <laughs> there's two bottles you're not allowed to try. What? You're not allowed to this try this rye. Right. And you're not allowed to try the Elmer T. Lee. There's two things oh. you're not allowed to try. Right. And it's so good. And so if you, if you do get a chance to buy it, Tracy's getting it shipped. It has like, it's oaky, it's caramelly, it's I'm hoping citrusy. you're getting floral, are you getting any floral notes? Cause that's what- Yes, I am. So I am getting floral notes. It's called, it's called linalool, it's in the rye, but it's, it's never able to be extracted in the amounts that he's pulling it out of because you're not able to get the whiskey usually that, the mash that hot. So he's actually able to get this component that turns into supposedly like jasmine and violet and these really beautiful floral notes. Yes, so that's there what I'm is- doing. I'm getting too excited. I'm clearly tipsy now. But now uh, we, have, we, we do have to we do have to leave. I'm keeping Matt late. So Mallory, you have $150 to spend. You're at a liquor store. Everything is available to you. What is the whiskey you buy be be besides Buffalo Trace? I know you love Buffalo Trace. Yeah, well, that. luckily I could buy like six bottles with $150. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the thing that I actually would really want to buy. So the thing that is very frustrating is there's still no major whiskey brands that are named after women. Um, mm. If you think of every, almost every single big bourbon, scotch whiskey Dude, brand. All Jefferson, in, it's all like Washington, old, old McBeard, Hamilton, old, dude, old dude Crow. Yeah, it's very frustrating. <laughs> but there, there's a couple. There's a couple that are that are named after women. They're not made by women, uh, except for one. There's this um, whiskey distillery called Saint Liberty. Tracy, I don't know if you know who they are. They have. Uh, uh, we were talking earlier about um, um, Bernie Burton, um, who is this. Um, uh, moonshiner and they made a whiskey after and the the company is mm. partly owned by women they made this whiskey called i think it's like birdie burton's bear gulch straight bourbon whiskey it's only like i think it's like only around 50 bucks i've been trying to find it out here uh but i really really want to try a bottle of it because it's so rare 
to find, do you have a bottle? I don't have that one. I have their four grain. Cause I love, I'm a big four grain person. So I have the, like, it's like Maria's four grain. It's again, it's named after a woman. Again, it's, it's a bootlegger. So that is a thing is they're creating these different expressions all named after bootleggers in history. So yes, I know them. I have a bottle. I didn't get the birdie, but I want, I, I want something so much because but there's it's another like, birdie is coming. There's another whiskey. It's a white whiskey actually that's coming. There's a basketball player if you can look it up, it just came out recently. There's a basketball player who's actually producing it, a black, and he it's a birdie something, but it's not from St. Liberty. Oh, I want, I want to try it so bad because I think it's another one of those weird things that, you know, we, we were trying to get as many women as possible into the into the whiskey industry, but it's weird when you like look at the shelf and it's all just like John, Paul, Dude. Joe, yeah. Yeah. Elijah. Like it's in, you know, I think it would really, and uh, we're not even going to get into Jane Walker. Jane Walker aside, most of, 99% of the time when you look at a shelf, it's all people who don't look like us in any any capacity. And I think it would be really, really, really cool. And that's why I want to get a bottle of uh, Bertie, Bertie Burton's Bear Gulch. Um, <laughs> also, I'm a huge bourbon fan. I'm obsessed with bourbon. Uh, I want to try every bourbon I can, but that's the one that I've been particularly looking for. I think I, I, I live in the mountains of California, um, but I found I, a BevMo in Palm Springs that I think has it. And I, we're going to try to. Am I allowed to give you one that actually is women? So Milliman Green. Those are the last names of two women. It's Heather Green and something Millam. They own it. Millam and Green is it's a woman-owned company, the distiller, the CEO, and they're writing this down. Those are women and it's women's last names, and it's delicious by the way. Right. Okay. I'll get Matt, I really apologize. I know you're in a hotel, but I do have to. Okay, well, the thing is, like, you I can't get three women that. talking about whiskey and expect them to not <laughs> talk forever. So we spent this whole past hour talking about bourbon, but we forgot to mention that I'm a scotch bitch, yeah. right? And so, like, I, I drank Abelor. Abundra. I wanted to tell you about that bottle. Forgot. Uh, it's well, such a good bottle. Yeah. So let me tell you the story about this bottle. I love Abelor. Uh, I was on a, I was on like a fifth or fourth date a couple of weeks ago. This dude dumped me. He's not gonna watch the show. It's okay. It's okay. He's not watching it. It's fine. He, I ordered this drink because it looks really good because I've had, I've had Abalore 16, right? And I know my scotch. And so I ordered the Abalore Abunda at this whiskey bar that I know. The bartender, I know this bartender. And he tries this whiskey. He's like, oh no, it's not good. And I'm like, uh, you're, something's wrong with your fucking tongue. <laughs> Uh, and then, like, so that's why, that's why I wanted to tell people about scotch. So, like, I began with, um, the reason I got into scotch, we were talking about representation and women in scotch, right? The only reason after I won that bottle of Blue Label back in college, like, the reason I decided to get into scotch was because there's this horrible show called How I Met Your Mother, and in that show, the female, one of the female actresses, Robert Sherbatsky, like, the characters, she loves scotch and cigars, and I was like, this bitch is really cool. <laughs> I was like, I've won this bottle of blended scotch. Why do not why not get into like scotch and cigars? And so like the first fancy bottle of scotch that I bought that is actually good that people should have is this is a Balmore 15, but I bought a Balmore 12. That was the first fancy bottle of scotch I bought because I spent my whole high school time watching Parks and Rec and like how I met your mother. And in Parks and Rec, um, what's his face? Ron Swanson drinks Lagavulin. And Lagavulin is really good. It's the, um, it's the Isla area of Scotland, whatever. And so in that area, Isla regions, before the, before the times were like, now there's not much difference in the regions, but before the times, the Isla regions are really, really peaty. And so Balmore is from the Isla regions. And so this is the Balmore 15, but my first fanciest bottle of scotch was the Balmore 12. And I bought that after I passed my third year exams, which are not really important exams at Berkeley, but like I still passed. So I was like, I deserve a bottle of scotch. And so then I finished that bottle like last year. And so I was like, let's get the Balmore 15. And it's so good. And then recently I went to a liquor store and they're like, I asked them for a uh, recommendation and they're like, you should get the Balmore 18. And I was like, no, let me right. finish the 16 first. But generally what I'm telling people is if you are a woman who is watching the 60, 55 women who are still on, on air, <laughs> 55 people who are still on air, if you are a woman, um, you should definitely try scotch. Don't let the men scare you away from trying scotch because like- You don't have to try the islands, right? You don't have to go- so don't have to I, have like, I, have a, I have a question that a I'm going to explode if I don't ask. And a yes. lot of really sensitive- and we'll note that first. So not everyone's ready to jump right into Band-Aid, burnt tires, a dead fish. Right? I love it. 
it is how I got in. Ardbeg 10 is my gateway whiskey, but also understand that you can do really beautiful, light, floral, Glenmorangie, Glenfiddich, Balvenie that are really light, that'll right. be more malty, roasted honey. I'm, I'm really sorry, Mallory. I think you're, get, you're gonna ask the question before you explode. So please ask your question and then, yeah. then I think we have to end. So, Marcia, do yes. you yeah. know who Bessie Williamson is? No, who is that? Ah! Okay, real, ah! I know, I know, I know. Trace, okay, so Bessie Williamson is one of my favorite people on the, I mean, she, she's, she's dead, but she's one of my heroes. So Bessie Williamson is the reason why Americans got into single malt scot scotch. She was the very first general manager of Lefroy. And it's, she was the reason, oh. because up, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. up until she, she worked in the 1960s and uh, from the 40s to the 60s. And she was the general manager of Lefroy. She started as a secretary there. She worked her way up. The, she was amazing. But up at, at that point, Lefroy was only a, a whiskey that, that got blended. You know, it was too, considered too strong, too smoky. And she, this, like bespectacled cardigan wearing yeah. up you know a hair in a tight bun lady was like I think people are ready to drink this very strong very peaty very smoky scotch and so she was such a um such an advocate for Isla as an island for um Isla whiskey as like a, an expression of the island itself that the Scotch Whiskey Association hired her to be their U.S. ambassador and she went on a tour in the 60s across America convincing bar owners and liquor store owners that not only was single malt because up until that point people really only drank blends not only was single malt something that people should care about and was something that customers would shell out for but that peaty smoky really really strong scotch you know was something that people would want to drink so it wasn't like some guy like Nick Offerman it was this like older Scottish lady with glasses who was really the person who fought for and convinced people she helped America change its its taste towards single malls and towards peatier scotches so anytime anyone says oh you know you're a girl you really can't handle something so smoky so peaty <laughs> Tell them about Bessie Williamson because the there only rate, one of the reasons why they're selling it is because of this like this like little dowdy Scottish lady. <laughs> well, basically, like, so I made the mistake. Uh, Lefroy Ten was a, not that fancy, but it was. I bought a I brought a bottle of Lefroy Ten. I'm so sorry, Matt. This is the last story. <laughs> I brought to a grad student party, and they all liked whiskey there because they're all grad students. You know, they all drink wine and whiskey. And they're, and like one of my friends is like, Varsha, I can't drink this Lafroy. It tastes like, you know, I'm sucking on charcoal. And I'm like, that's the point, man. That's that's the point. <laughs> and so like, I, I could not understand this whole, like, these were all white dudes and they just couldn't handle Isla Scotch. And I was like, how dare you tell me I shouldn't be buying a cigar? Like, how dare you tell me I shouldn't be buying like scotch? Like, you can't handle a Freud. And so I, I just wanted to say to Tracy that I just get a lot of hate on Twitter whenever somebody asks you a scotch recommendation, and I immediately was like, yeah, you should go for Lefroy Ten. I don't know. I'm just I'm like, just do it. Just rip off the band aid. Suck some charcoal. We should end it. I don't know. It totally depends on what people normally like. Yeah. That's right. I, yeah, I think there's you. there's room probably for 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 people to drink all sorts of different whiskeys. Yeah. But I think the thing that we've learned here is that uh, thank you to bespectacled old Scottish ladies. Um, you know, scotch is, is <laughs> yes. very popular, and that yes. it's, it is impossible to teach history of any type, but especially American history, without thinking about race and gender within it. So and so, as historians, we will continue to do that, despite what some people may say. And so, with exactly. that, thank you so much, Mallory, yeah. for joining us. Uh, but Girly oh, Drinks is out in blast. October. And uh, no, Tracy great. Franklin, Girly again, drink. from Nearest Inge Yes, thank you so much for joining us. Everybody have a wonderful Friday evening or afternoon, wherever you are. And until next week, where we'll have Megan Kate Nelson um, talk about the American Civil War, a Pulitzer Prize finalist. And until then, cheers. Cheers. cheers.